Greetings, brothers and sisters. So, a um, bunch of things to get to about Trump and the media's reaction to Trump uh, saying that he wants to suspend the Constitution or whatever he said. And it's hilarious. Their reaction, their outrage, their outrage about this and a little bit more on the yay stuff, their outrage on yay, is a lot like when Trump won the election. <laughs> um, you know, they're kind of happy because, in this case, they're kind of happy because they have something to talk about and their passion and obsession with Trump. But they're also miserable because they're always miserable and they can't control everything and the world won't adhere to their pure vision of reality, which, you know, they think is pristine and it is without reproach. Um, like their arrogance and their thinking they know more than they do. But let's start here. Morning Joe is the best, Mika. Um, as I watched a little of this, I didn't watch most of the other stuff I showed you. It was just all popped up on my YouTube feed. Um, but let's start here with one. Mika J. Brzezinski. Former President Donald Trump's false claims about the 2020 election now have him calling for the Constitution to be terminated. Boom. Look at this. Like, is this a... I mean... <laughs> this dude is upset. It came after Twitter owner Elon Musk promised to expose how the company suppressed free speech by blocking the New York Post story about Hunter Biden in the run-up to the 2020 election. The so-called Twitter files were released on Friday but failed to show any evidence that Democrats or the government pressured Twitter into suppressing the story still. Okay, so that's where the... Um, this thing goes off the rails because she just said that the government and the um, <laughs> and the and the DNC didn't pressure Twitter to not to um, suppress the story about Hunter Biden. What about everybody else? Like, what about you, Mika? What about all the media suppressing the story? Every one of you guys suppressed the story. It was a real story, a huge story. Right, the pre the guy running for president, son, who was an admitted crackhead and wrote a whole book about his crack addiction, had had a long history of getting jobs he didn't deserve while smoking crack. When you smoke crack, that's your whole life. Crack is your life. It's not like you're a great performer of everything, right? That you're somehow um, good at your job and you're a good family. A good husband and you know, or wife or whatever, good, you know, citizen and a crack addict. Crack is all consuming, right? It's a, you know, any of these addictions people know about, any of these opioid addictions, but crack is like one of the worst ones, right? There was a, when I worked in treatment centers, I worked in this sort of, you know, new age treatment center in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. It had some rich people, some famous people kind of thing that came through there, you know, mildly famous, like, you know, you know, people who wrote songs for famous people, things like that. And then, you know, just really rich people. And there's a lot of these places all around the, the country where these, you know, ultra wealthy people go to, you know, process their addictions and things. You know, I had this job when I was in graduate school. And one of my um, duties was to pick people up at the airport. And that was a real treat because they would come in sometimes inebriated and I had to bring them to a hospital. It was like, you know, it was a nightmare. And I was supposed to pick up this former judge or this woman who was a respected judge, a married woman, respected in the community, you know, one of these sort of, you know, local, uh, you know, powerful people in some big city or whatever it was. And she didn't, she didn't show, right? And apparently what had happened was she was this, you know, this powerful, successful woman, lawyer and judge and all these things. And she started to smoke crack. And within two months, she wrecked her marriage, blew through all their family's money, and was prostituting herself for crack. And she never showed in the treatment center. So I, you know, I assume she's like in debt, dead or in jail, right? Crack is all consuming. And so you had this crackhead who was, you know, um, impregnated a stripper named Dallas from Arkansas. I mean, all that funny stuff. And 
It was a huge story, and they ignored it. He dropped his his multiple computers into bathtubs and was, was leaving these things to be repaired in shops all across the Delaware region where he was living. And, you know, these laptops had all kinds of incriminating stuff on them and sensationalistic stuff on them. And the FBI, which had the laptop, the Department of Justice, Bill Barr, under Trump, he was supposed to be Trump's stooge, and the, you know, the, so was the government. Certainly D, the DNC was pressuring social media. I mean, like she's ignoring the fact that, um, Mika's ignoring the fact that the DNC had done so many, like, uh, you know, off the rails pressure on social media to stop the so-called, you know, conspiracy theories that they claim defeated Hillary Clinton in the 2016 election. They were pressuring for suppression and deplatforming of anybody that wasn't along with their agenda. So for her to come out here, let's listen to that again. All the company suppressed free speech by blocking the New York Post story about Hunter Biden in the run-up to the 2020 election. The so-called Twitter files were released on Friday, but failed to show any evidence that Democrats or the government pressured Twitter into suppressing the story. Still... So, I mean, it's just their inability for self-evaluation, self-perception, right? That she and all the media dropped the ball on this mega story. This, you know, huge story that should have been released, right? This was a story that should have came out before the election. And had it come out again, like the whole thing is just a show to me, and you know, whatever. It's just the official story, like I don't care or whatever, I didn't vote for Trump. But in this story, if that, sh- if that bombshell comes out right before the election, again, this is like two weeks before the election, about Hunter Biden, and dominates the news cycle. All they can talk about is Hunter Biden and his laptop. And they reveal all the stuff that's on it. Uh, there's no way Jojo Magoo wins. There's just no way, right? There's no way they can even pretend he wins because, like, he, you know, his, he, he was involved in that. Like, his name's all over the place and. You know, he's a part of this this crackheads, you know, he uses his dad's influence to get money so he can support his crack habit. And all that implies. He's a seedy dude and Jojo Magoo's tied to him in every possible way. And them conspiring, this is a real conspiracy to suppress this story. This is the story. And this should be the story now. Mika should be talking about how they all failed. They failed in their duty. Like, they can no longer call themselves journalists. They can no longer, you know, call themselves people seeking the truth, any of these things, right? They can't do it anymore. Like, this is, you know, they're, this is their, there's no coming back from this for the, all the mainstream media that didn't cover this story. I mean, the New York Post, you know, it's something I go to for, like, you know, sensationalistic garbage, right? It's something I go for my comedy stuff. And they were the only ones pushing the story, and they were, you know, they were, you know, deplaf. They were uh, susp- account was suspended on Twitter, Twitter, and all these other places, and they purposely didn't cover this story. And for Mika to come out and say there was no evidence that the Democrats, when Hillary started whining about fake news and how the Russians hacked the election, and because they no longer had the media, Hillary had two to one money, she had twice as much money as Donald J. Trump's, right? And so she was supposed to be a shoe in and she wasn't because there was now social media where information can be. But, you know, even without that, I mean, people just didn't like her. Right. And so, you know, they they did everything possible to make sure that social media was censoring oppositional opinions, anything coming from the right or truth community stuff. And this Hunter Biden story was one of them. It was a real story and they all should have covered it. It's a failure on their part. This is from the very sort of liberal-leaning political magazine. And this was about Donna Brazile, who was a Democrat, who was so much of a Democrat that when disgraced um, Debbie Wasserman Schultz was fired as head of the DNC, they were $12 million in debt, which we'll get into here. And then they got hacked a couple times. 
and she failed. So they put in Donna Brazil as temporary head of the Democratic National Committee, the number one Democratic person, right? And this is what she wrote about what went down there. She said, before I called Bernie Sanders, so it says here, Donna Brazil is the former intern chair of the Democratic National Committee, excerpts from the book Hacks, the inside story of the break-ins and breakdowns to put Donald Trump in the White House. It's a book she wrote. And she said this, before I called Bernie Sanders, I lit a candle in my living room and put on some gospel music. I wanted to center myself for what I knew would be an emotional phone call. I had promised Bernie when I took the helm of the Democratic National Committee after the convention that I would get to the bottom of whether Hillary's team had rigged the nomination process as a cache of emails stolen by Russian hackers and posted online had suggested. I had my suspicions from the moment I walked in the door of the DNC a month or so earlier based on the leaked emails, but who knew if some of the of some of that might have been forged. I needed to get solid proof, so I did I so I so I did Bernie. So I followed the money. My predecessor, Florida Republican Desmond Washerman Schultz, had not been the most active chair in fundraising at the time when Barack Obama's neglect had left the party in a significant debt. As Hillary's as Hillary's campaign gained momentum, she resolved the party's debt and put on a, put it on a starvation diet. It had become dependent on her campaign for survival, for which she expected to wield control of the operations. He left them in $12 million worth of debt. Obama did. Debbie was not a good manager. She hadn't been interested in controlling the party, so she let, Hillary, let Clinton's headquarters in Brooklyn do, it, do as she desired. So, so, so she didn't have to inform the party officers how bad the situation was. How much control Brooklyn had and for how long was still something I had been trying to uncover for the last few weeks. By September 7th, the day I called Bernie, I had found my proof, and it broke my heart. The Saturday morning after the convention in July, I called Gary Glenzer, the chief financial officer of Hillary's campaign. He wasted no words. He told me the Democratic Party was broke and $2 million in debt. It was really 12 When I screamed, I, I am an officer of the party, and they've been telling us everything is fine, and they were raising money with no problem. That wasn't true, he said. Officials from Hillary's campaign had taken a look at the DNC book. Obama left the party $24 million in debt, $15 million in bank debt, so it was even more than they thought, and more than $8 million owed to vendors after the 2012 campaign, and had been paying that off slowly. Obama's campaign was not scheduled to pay it off until 2016, Hillary for America campaign, and the Hillary Victory Fund, its joint fundraising vehicle with the DNC, had taken care of 80% of the debt in 2016, about $10 million, and had placed the party on an allowance. Okay, so there were vendors, people who were contracted to do things with the Democratic Party, and they weren't paying them, something that Trump does, right? This is Trump behavior. Trump screws his vendors. This is something I've talked about some uh, Republican barber in, uh, in uh, Nevada, you know, near uh, Vegas, when I lived in Vegas, was telling me this. This guy was a, you know, he's a Fox News Republican. He said, you know, all these people that he knew said that Trump was always screwing people and not paying vendors. The same kind of behaviors they were always talking about Trump doing, they were doing. They, the party wasn't paying the people they had contracted to do things, like, you know, whether it be a you know, some catering company or something or whatever it is, right? You know, halls and things that they rented, you know, for uh, events. I didn't know anything about this. I assumed that none of the officers knew about it either. This was just Debbie's way in my experience. She didn't come to the officers of the DNC for advice or counsel. She seemed to make decisions on her own and let us know at the last minute what she had decided, as she had done when she told about the hacking only minutes before the Washington story. Washington Post broke the news. On the phone, Gary told me the DNC needed $2 million loan, which the campaign had arranged. No, that can't be true. The party cannot take out a loan without unanimous agreement of all the officers. Gary, how did they do this without me knowing? I asked. I don't know how Debbie relates to the officers. She's like a person in the board, right? Debbie Wasserman Schill. She's a powerful person in the Democratic Party. 
He described the party as fully under the control of Hillary's campaign, which seems to confirm the suspicion of the Bernie camp. The campaign had the DNC on life support, giving it money every month to meet its basic needs, while the campaign was using the party as a fundraising clearinghouse. Under the FCEC law, an individual can contribute a maximum of 2000 700 directly to the presidential campaign, but the limits are much more higher, are much higher for contributions to state parties and a party's national committee. Individuals had maxed out their 2,700 contribution limit, and the campaign could write an additional check of $300,000 to the Hillary Victory Fund. The figure represented $10,000 each of 32 states' parties who were party of the Victory Fund agreement. $320,000 and $33 to the DNC. The money would be deposited in the state first and transferred to the DNC shortly after that. Money in the battleground states usually stayed in the state, but all the other f- states funneled that money directly to the DNC, which quickly transferred the money to Brooklyn. See, this is how Trump saved the Democratic Party. They were broke. Like after Obama, who had a lot of enthusiasm, and raised a you know ton of money, they you know they didn't have anything. Nobody liked Hillary, and they still donated to her, right? And so she she raised a billion dollars because people were scared of Donald Trump, and then all the stuff that they've done since then with Donald Trump, they've been able to bring in a lot of money, right? You know, FTX money. I mean, all this stuff they've been able to bring in money. But they were, they were, you know, they were asked out. They were completely broke. And so she said, wait, I said the victory fund was supposed to be for whoever was the nominee in the state party races. You're telling me that Hillary has been controlling it since she's, before she got the nomination. So there was a victory fund for the nominee, and Bernie Sanders was running a close race with her. And she said, that was a deal Robbie struck with Debbie, he explained, referring to the campaign manager, Robbie Mook. Who, who was who was to sustain the DNC? He sent ne- the party nearly twenty million from September until the convention, and much to prepare for the election. So Hillary bought off the DNC, and then they actually did things to help rig it against Bernie Sanders. What's the burn rate, Gary? I asked. How much money do we need every month to fund the party? The burn rate was three point five million dollars to four million a month. He said. I gasped. I had a pretty good sense of the DNC's operations after having served as the interim chair five years earlier. So she has been the chair, an interim chair, twice for the DMC. She's a real insider, right? Back back then, the usual monthly expenses were half that. What had happened, the party chair usually shrinks the staff between presidential election campaigns, but Debbie had chosen not to do that. She had stuck lots of consultants on the DNC payroll and it was Obama's consultants were being financed by the DNC too. So they usually lay off people between presidential elections to keep the budget down, the payroll. And Debbie Wasserman Schultz, besides getting hacked, was just burning through money, right? And they just, you know, nobody knew about this. When we hung up, and, you know, they're blaming the Russians and the hackers and, you know, all these things for losing to Trump. Like, this is completely mismanaged, right? When we hung up, I was livid. Not at Gary, but at this mess I had inherited. I knew that Debbie had outsourced a lot of the management of the party and not been the greatest at fundraising. I would not be that kind of chair, even if I was only an interim chair. Did they think I would be a surrogate for them, get out of the road and rouse up the crowds? I was going to manage the party the best I could and try to make it better, even if Brooklyn did not like this. It would be two, It would be weeks before I would get to fully understand the it would be weeks before I would fully understand the financial shenanigans shenanigans that were keeping the party on life support. Right around the time of the convention, the leaked emails revealed Hillary's campaign was grabbing money from the state parties for its own purposes, leaving the states with very little support down ballot races. A political story on the published on May 2, 2016 described the big fundraising vehicles that, la- that she had launched through the states and summed up before quoting a vow she was made to rebuild. The party from the ground up, when our state parties are strong, we win. That's, that's what will happen. 
Yet the states kept less than half a percent of the 82 million that had been re- amassed from the extravagant fundraisers Hillary's campaign was holding, just as Gary described to me when he and I talked in August. When the political story described the arrangement as essentially money laundering for the, Clampin, the Clinton campaign, so she was raising money that was supposed to be for the state races in the party, but it was money for her, right? And so um, Hillary's people were outraged at being accused of doing something shady. Bernie's people were angry for their own reasons, saying this was part of a calculated strategy to throw the nomination to Hillary. I wanted to believe Hillary, who had made campaign finance reform part of her platform, but I had made this pledge to Bernie and did not want to disappoint him. I kept asking the party lawmakers and the DNC staff to show me the agreements that the party had made for sharing the money they had raised. But there was lots of shuffling of feet and looking the other way. When I got back from a vacation in Martha's Vineyard, I at last found the document that described it all the joint fundraising agreement between the DNC and the Hillary Victory Fund and Hillary for America. The agreement signed by Ann Amy Dacey, the former CEO of the DNC, and Robbie Mook, with a copy to Mark Ellis, Elias, specifically that in exchange for raising money and investing in the DNC, Hillary would control the party's finances, strategy, and all the money raised. Her campaign had the right of refusal of who the Demo- who the party communication director and would make the final decision on all other staff. So she's putting in all pro-Hillary people and she's running the DNC while she's in a primary in a competition with Bernie. So she's running the organization that's in charge of the competition between her and Bernie, which is like so effed up, right? She is saying, "All right, I'm the nominee. Like I'm buying the, I'm buying the Democratic Party." The DNC was also required to consult with the campaign about all other staffings, budgeting data, analytics, analytics, and mailing. I had been wondering why it was that I couldn't write a press release without passing it by Brooklyn. Well, here was the answer. So everything they did had to go through Hillary's campaign. When the party chooses the nominee, the custom is that the candidate's team starts to exercise more control over the party. If the party has an incumbent candidate, as in the case with Clinton in 1996 or Obama in 2012, that was Bill Clinton. This kind of arrangement is seamless because the party is already under control of the president. When you have an open contest without an incumbent, the competitive parties, the party comes under the candidate's control only after the nominee is certain. When I was the manager of Al Gore campaign 2000, we started inserting our people in the DNC in June. The Victory Fund agreement, however, had been signed in August of 2015. That's a whole year before the whole, all of it, right? Just four months after Hillary announced her candidacy and nearly a year before she officially had the nomination. I tried to search out any evidence of internal corruption that showed the DNC was rigging the system to throw the primary to Hillary but I could not find any in the party affairs among the staff. I had gone, uh, I, I had gone department by department in, investigating individual contact from evidence of skewed decision, and I was happy to see I had found none. Then I found this agreement. The funding agreement with the HFA and the Victory Fund agreement was not le- illegal, but it sure looked unethical. If the fight had been fair, One campaign would have to control the party before the voters had decided, would not have control of the party before the voters decided which one they wanted to lead. This was not a criminal act, but as I saw it, it compromised the party's integrity. I kept my promise to Bernie. I was in agony as I dialed to keeping the secrets, was against everything I stood for, all that I valued as a woman and a public servant. Hello, Senator. I completed my review of the DNC, and I did find the, the cancer, but I will not kill the patient. I discussed the fundraising agreement that each of the candidates had signed. Bernie was familiar with it, but he and his staff ignored it. They had their own way of raising money through small donations. I described how Hillary's, Hillary's campaign had taken it to another step. I told Bernie I had found Hillary's joint fundraising agreement. I explained that the cancer that she had exerted this control over the party long before 
she became its nominee. And I had known this. I, if I, had I known this, I never had accepted the interim chair position. But here, here, here we were with with only weeks before the election. Bernie took it stoically. He did not yell or express the outrage. To express outrage, instead, he asked me what I thought Hillary's chances were. The polls were unanimous in her winning, but what he wanted to know was my own assessment. I had to be frank with him. I did not trust the polls. I said, I told him I had visited states around the country and found a lack of enthusiasm for her everywhere. I was concerned about the Obama coalition and about millennials. Um, So again, here's her book here that um, hacks. And I guess she works for Fox now because after writing this book, look, there's an upside down White House, right? I mean, the DNC was an absolute mess. So I'm saying this because Mika said, well, we'll get back to what Mika said here, where she says, there's no evidence that the DNC had anything to do with, and I didn't get into the whole, you know, the report that was put out there about Russia interference and social media's effect on Hillary losing the election, right? I mean, so there's the evidence of the, the DNC and everybody else pressuring Twitter and Facebook and you and YouTube and you know all these other um, social media platforms to suppress stories, you know it's I mean like it's not even debatable, right? So let's go back to Mika here when she said this. The so-called Twitter files were released on Friday, but failed to show any evidence that Democrats or the government pressured Twitter into suppressing the story. Still, Trump tweeted this on. So <laughs> we'll get back. We'll go back to this in a second. Um, Trump tweeted this. Like, that's where she's going with this, right? We know that what happened here with them not covering this story is the story. The story is the suppression of the Hunter Biden laptop and, you know, hard drive, right? That's the story. And Elon Musk has confirmed it. And that social media, at least they, we now know Twitter, we know all every, all the other social media was pressured. And, you know, they were all Democrats anyway. I mean, this was something where they decided to suppress a mega story, one of the biggest scandals in, you know, presidential nomination history, right? It's a modern day salacious story with hookers and strippers and, you know, crackheads and foreign governments and all these conspiracies. And the DNC had, you know, in the past rigged it against Bernie and rigged it again, right? And so when Jojo Magoo was, you know, the early primary states of North Carolina, of, uh, of um, New Hampshire, which he did horribly in, he was like fifth in New Hampshire and fourth in Iowa. And so he was the front runner for most of the year, but he was like, you know, senile and just a dope, and nobody liked him. They saved his campaign in South Carolina. And so that guy Clyburn made sure that, you know, he put out his support and made sure that they they got JoJo Magoo a win in South Carolina. But his campaign was dead and buried. And so from that moment on, the DNC conspired against Bernie again because they didn't want to run a socialist against Trump, right? The, they figured the only guy they could win against Trump, the only person was was Biden for whatever reason. That's what they thought. And they came out, the, the DNC, the people in the, you know, there's, these were senators and, you know, elected officials, and they all came out and said, on national TV, you can go back and, you know, there's various clips, I'm not going to go find them. But they said how we're not going to let Bernie Sanders win the, the nomination, so they got um, Klobuchar and uh, oh, who's that guy, um, Pete Buttigieg, to withdraw and throw their support behind Biden. They kept Lizzie Warren in as she was running on, uh, she was running on the same platform as Bernie Sanders. So she would split the socialist liberal vote, and now some of the more neutral conservative candidates withdrew, and then they had that big Super Tuesday. And Biden won big because the DNC pressured all the, you know, the various candidates to, you know, they kept Lizzie Warren in and, and had the other two withdraw. And so now he had, it was just him against Bernie and he had all the advantages, right? 
But that was a way to rig the election there. I mean, that was a rigged election that was admitted to. They came out even beforehand. We're not going to let Bernie win. And then Bernie was, you know, twice screwed out of the nomination. And so that's how the DNC rolls. And for Mika to come out here and make this, you know, about Trump and his tweet, when this story is about Hunter Biden and his laptop and the suppression of that story. See, what Hillary Clinton learned and what the FBI, NSA, and CIA learned when they put out their joint report, and what the DNC learned and what everyone else learned about the 2016 election, that social media was everything. Trump was great on Twitter. I mean, he wasn't great. He was, you know, well, he was Trump on Twitter. And Trump and his supporters and, you know, Hillary haters and all the, you know, all that, I mean, was dominated social media. And that regular media, which they'd been used to using because that's what they knew, sucked and was for old people. Back when Bill Clinton got elected, it was the baby boomers, right? The baby boomers were young. The baby boomers had energy. And so that generation, and they dominated the news and the other things, right? Um, But now it was social media. And the only way they, they would ever win another election was to suppress the social media, especially from the so-called truth movement and anybody who's posting things outside the official story. And the official story had to be dominated by, you know, the, the social media had to suppress anything. And we all experience this. We all know. Anybody posted on social media during the 2020 election, before the 2020 election, knew that there has been huge changes of suppression and censorship to one side, right? And I'm not a Republican, and I didn't vote for Trump. But just in terms of truthers pushing out information about an alternative narrative, that wasn't allowed. And there's so many ways suppression has continued through the, you know, through the through the COVID restrictions and all of it, right? And there's various ways to suppress. Like on YouTube, they can give you a community guideline strikes and strike and delete your video but they also can demonetize something. So, it, you know, and even if it's going to eventually be monetized, it takes a day for them to review it. So, you know, stories don't get out there as quick. And in fact, they, they literally, YouTube is, was pressured to put out authoritative news, right? Remember when they pulled Facebook and various social media outlets into the Congress, the, the Senate to testify they grilled my Mark Zuckerberg about doing enough about fake news and all these things. And so YouTube, to, you know, to pacify the Democratic Party, because YouTube and other social media giants want as much user involvement. And so they were pressured be- for pushing out so-called conspiracy theories as using them in algorithms. And because conspiracy theories were, I mean, think about how it was in, on YouTube before 2016 or 17 and even before that like you could just say anything and put out anything in terms of so-called conspiracy theories truth or theories and it could be completely false or it could be you know very damaging to the government or it could be anything right and you know it was allowed and then they they came in and they said we're only going to promote authoritative news and so now if you search something looking for a truth or video you would get CNN, you would get MSNBC, and sometimes Fox. You would get what YouTube called authoritative news, the news that nobody wanted. No no one was going to YouTube to watch that. They had their own platforms, right? It's readily available. You can find CNN and MSNBC and Fox on cable news networks and, you know, all these other places. But, you know, not on the Internet. You're not looking for that. You know, maybe if you're, like, doing what I do here and mocking them or whatever, right? But most people were looking for alternative narratives and they weren't getting it because they rigged the algorithms against anything that wasn't the official story. And Mika, who herself had said that was her job, right? Okay, I'll show you that after I'm done with this narrative here. Said it was her job uh, to, you know, their job to control the minds of the American people and not Trump's. And so for her and all these people to come out and pretend like they didn't suppress a story, that they didn't you know, find a way to to push back against social media and pressure social media to give people what they didn't want and to, you know, promote the official story 
is just an out and out lie, right? It's embarrassing. And to make this story that they're now covering about Trump and his, you know, stupid tweet, which we'll get to in a second, about the Constitution, and not about their failure, collective failure, or their not their failure, their success at suppressing the Hunter Biden story. So here's what Mika said about it was her job, you know, the media's job, to tell them, tell the people what to think. The dangerous, you know, edges here are that he's trying to undermine the media, trying to make up his own facts, and it could be that while unemployment and uh, the the economy worsens, he could have undermined the messaging so much that he can actually control right. uh, exactly what people think, and that if, is the that is our you, job. Let's get back to it here. Any evidence that Democrats or the government? pressured Twitter into suppressing the story. Still, Trump tweeted this on Saturday. With the revelation of massive and widespread fraud and deception and working closely with big tech companies, the DNC and the Democrat Party, do you throw the presidential election results of 2020 out and declare the rightful winner? Or do you have a new election? A massive fraud of this type and magnitude allows for the termination of all rules, regulations, and articles, even those found in the Constitution. Democrats were quick to condemn the remarks. The White House... Yeah, of course they were. Um, So, again, like I, I have a totally different view than Trumpers or most of you and everybody else. Like, I think the whole system's rigged. Like, the whole system has to be rigged. Because if you let nature run its course, and I got a great comment I want to get to in a moment, but if you let nature run its course, and Mika's doubled down, like she came in again. um, (laughs) Interesting bone structure, bro structure on Mika. Um, Is that when you let nature run its course, it would destroy our debt-based economy and our whole system, right? Our system's unnatural, and it goes against the divine system. And so the people that control the system have to control everything, especially since a lot of it's based in deception and lies and, you know, uh, deviant desires and things like this, right, that go away from your soul's purpose here. And so, you know, we all have to live with that because we're dependent on that system, right? But... In terms of the official story, I think most people can agree if the Hunter Biden story came out, Jojo Magoo would not have been able to win president. They couldn't, you know, do they couldn't sell it. He would it would, he would have been done, right? And so it's reasonable to assume that these people who are obsessed with Trump and we'll get into that more in a bit, right? Trump is the center of their universe. You know, it's not God is the center of their universe. It's not Biden and the Democrats who are the center of the, their universe, Trump is. They wake up every day looking forward to finding out about Trump, talking about Trump, 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 Trump right? And so I guess we talk about it now. So that's what Mika and all these people do. Trump is the, you know, is the is their son, right? They revolve around Trump. Like everything revolves around Trump. And the Democratic Party, which we we now know from, its former head, it's, you know, someone who was a chair on their, on the, you know, the controlling committee, Donna Brazil, and then she became head of the DNC temporarily twice. She said they were, you know, dead ass broke and completely dysfunctional and all these things, right? And so Trump breathed life into, I mean, they they got good ratings for once, CNN and MSNBC, and the DNC got money and enthusiasm not from their candidate, but from the enemy, right? From the the evil Trump. So Trump is the center of their universe, right? And so if their, you know, their ideology was, and, you know, I had that guy, I can't remember who it was, but he was somebody famous. He said, yeah, the, the election was rigged. You know, everything was rigged against Trump because we couldn't let, allow him to be elected again. And once you did that, you violated the Constitution and everything else, the democracy, when you decided you knew more than the American people, and when you suppressed a story, and they all did, and they're still suppressing this story, what you acknowledged was that 
you couldn't beat Trump in a clean election where you did your job as a journalist and reported on an epic story that was Hunter Biden. House released the following statement. The American Constitution is a sacrosanct document that for over 200 years has guaranteed that freedom and the rule of law prevail in our great country. The Constitution brings the American people together regardless of party and elected leaders swear to uphold it. Yeah, but they don't, right? I mean, the Constitution has been you know, used as toilet paper, right, for the corporate greed and everything else. But they couldn't beat Trump if the Hunter Biden story ran, if they let everything go in a natural, organic way. And so, you know, that is in every way unconstitutional because they suppress people's ability to talk about this epic story on social media. And they've been pressuring social media forever, right? They've been, um, you know, that's one of the, the realizations here. It's the ultimate monument to all of the Americans who have given their lives to defeat self-serving despots and abused their power and trampled on fundamental rights, attacking the Constitution. And all it stands for is anathema to the soul of our nation and should be universally condemned. You can not only love America when you win. Most top Republicans have so far been... So... You got to get to the fact that you guys covered up this story. Like you're admitting that Twitter has finally admitted to this, which means you also covered it up, right? We all know that it is the, you know, the hard drive, which you guys still haven't reported on. I mean, think about it. This hard drive that has all kinds of things on it, right? It's all the things that have been reported about it. And a lot of it is criminal, maybe even, you know, um, it's uh, traitorous, right? It's close to being traitorous, and it involves foreign companies and foreign governments and you know, buying off a president, his family, and his son, and all these things, right? It's an epic scandal. And we now it's now been confirmed that it's Hunter Biden's laptop and that it was suppressed by the FBI and everybody else. You have to be able to admit that you failed, right? Like that's, you know, part of your job that you are part of this, but all they go is Trump, 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 Trump. All they can do is attack Trump, right? Silent. Republican Congressman Adam Kinzinger tweeted this. With the former president calling to throw aside the Constitution, not a single conservative can legitimately support him, and not a single supporter can be called a conservative. This is insane. Trump hates the Constitution. He then called on top Republican House members, Kevin McCarthy, Elise Stefanik. And okay, so again, you're stepping all over the headline here. This was from the New York Post. These were the spies that all lied, and they falsely discredited the Hunter Biden laptop. These were all people in the you know, intelligence community and so many other people. Like, this was an epic conspiracy. This was a legitimate conspiracy. So this guy got into it. He was the first one to report on it. Joining me now, CNN political analyst and White House correspondent for the GRIO, April Ryan, and CNN Political commentator, Republican strategist, Alice Stewart. Uh, Alice, how... Uh, Do you have any non-ghouls? <laughs> Do you have any people that are alive and have a pulse that are, you know, have hearts? Worried are Republicans about uh, this... Oh, wow. What's going on here, bro? What is going on here, you conehead m and Like, what? <laughs> what is... They're concerned. Yeah. Uh, that's why they're, it's really... Uh, all, all hands on deck from, from now through Tuesday. We have... Um, he didn't say the words terminate the Constitution. Senators uh, Tim Scott and, and also uh, John Kennedy from Louisiana going in there. And they're making the case more about the impetus on this. Of course, Democrats will... Okay, we move on to the next thing here. The former president, Donald Trump, and a current candidate to return as leader of the free world, so this is very newsworthy and noteworthy this morning, is calling to terminate the Constitution. Seriously, the centerpiece of American democracy in order to overturn the 2020 election and be reinstated to power. The job, of course, hinges upon upholding the Constitution, something he swore on when he... See, this is how they always do their yellow journalism, or whatever they call it, right? This is, um, you know, where there is an epic story here, and that is that social media and the regular media, the Democratic Party, 
and even the Republican Party, and even Fox News, all conspired to suppress a story that would have changed the presidential, uh, the outcome of a presidential election. It's a monstrous story. And there's intrigue. And, you know, Hunter Biden is, you know, a Trump-like candidate where their universe, your universe could be Hunter Biden, right? Like there are people who are, you know, they're Hilaria Baldwin obsessed people. And there was a bunch of people that were always talking about Corey Feldman, the, what he called the wolf pack, right? There's people who, you know, get obsessed with somebody in a negative way. And you could easily do that with Hunter Biden or just, you know, the whole the Hunter Biden as a character is a very interesting character in the story because of the crack addiction and the impregnated a stripper and the foreign deals. I mean, if there was a movie about Hunter Biden, like not that crappy one that was made, that low budget Republican movie that sucked. But if there was like a real, you know, mini series about Hunter Biden, it'd be interesting, right? Like, you know, there's a drama like, you know, it's a the villain is always important. You have to have a good villain in, you know, most movies and TV shows. He became president and something he touted throughout his four-year term. Let's remind you of that. We're supposed to protect our country, support our country. Okay. Let's go to the panel here. <laughs> I was actually speechless. I was speechless when I read it, and then watching Republicans try to respond to it on the the Sunday shows, and some really came out. I think in an wow, look at Don Lemons. He looks weird. He's important way. And looks like a turtle. Said that's basically ridiculous. Yeah. You Which have is a table stakes for constitutional sure. conservatives. Right. I mean, that's sure. kind of Thank required. You. Okay, you know, but you're you're getting into the fact that you guys all covered up this story, right? And none of them are coming clean because like, they can't, right? They can't admit. Their failure. All the Republicans knew he lost. They decided to let him cry it out, like an 18 month. You mean like you did with Hillary Clinton? And now we know that you guys conspired to rig this against his Trump and, you know, all these things because you withheld the story. It was your job to report on Hunter Biden. That's a story you have to report on, right? <laughs> you have to report on that. Like their incompetence, I mean, you know, they're not journalists, but like they can't even, they should just head their, they should just hang their heads in shame, right? Their failure to report on this story. I mean, when it broke that it was his laptop and they still didn't cover it, right? We, we knocked that out around two, I think, in the toddler book I read. They let him cry it out. He seeds disinformation. Stuart Rhodes says, you know, I'm waiting for. Oh my gosh. She's like, look at these ghouls, right? And the hammer guy had to get in on it. Well, this weekend, as Donald Trump's criminal defense lawyers watched helplessly, their client, in another act of bre Trump's confession, breathtaking legal stupidity, confessed. Again, talking about him. Well, there's one more thing I want to get to here. Again, this time, Donald Trump's new criminal confession will be of extreme interest to the federal prosecutors who have convened a grand jury in Washington, D.C., investigating Donald Trump's intent on January 6th. Okay, again. Let's move on to Donald Trump, who's now... Wait, you're, you're, going, you're talking about... <laughs> you're talking about Trump? Denying, but you know, this is what he does, guys. He puts something out there, tries to walk it back, but he said it. And every time he says it, Guess what we have found in the past six years? You can believe him. You just had a guy in your same network talk about his criminal stupidity, right? Trump's criminal defense lawyers watched helplessly, their client, in another act of breathtaking legal stupidity. Breathtaking legal, legal stupidity. So they present Trump as being a criminal mastermind and a, a criminal boob, right? Like, you know, a an incompetent boob, and also a criminal mastermind. Like, you can't be both. You can't present this guy as some sort of, you know, genius evildoer and someone who's an incompetent, stupid boob, right? And they've done this all wrong, these two mutually exclusive narratives. This is how they're, you know, the media just sucks. There's no logic to it. There's no reason. Donald Trump is everything that he, they need him to be to run their, like, stupid propaganda. Guess what we have found in the past six years? You can believe him. 
So even though he is denying that he called for the termination of the Constitution over his false claims of election fraud, he posted this on his social media site yesterday. The fake news is actually... Okay, we saw this, right? Um, yes, you know, she read this before. So this was uh, the follow-up. This is this morning. They talked about the first part of this video. I showed you Mika from yesterday, and then this is today. What drives people crazy is if you leave out something that would minimize your judgment of them. Let's say somebody does something wrong, right? They do something wrong. Let's say a wife cheats on a husband. And, you know, the husband has been neglecting her, not only in terms of sexually, but not giving her any attention, right? Ignores her, treat, mistreats her, you know, all these things. You know, there's some, um, you know, there's a lack of something, right? Like he's withdrawn from the relationship. Or maybe he had an affair years ago. And if you ignored all of that and you just talked about the woman having the affair, then it's unfair, right? It's unfair because there's context that's important. Like when you're having an argument with somebody, they won't acknowledge some central part of your argument, right? And they dismiss evidence and they minimize context. And that's what they're doing here. They're pretending like the Hunter Biden thing is nothing, and it's not. They've never once talked about it. They've never once talked about it being a story, and a story that they should have covered and the FBI should have released in the, Depart in the Justice Department. William Barr said that he didn't want to make that you know, part of the, you know, the, the political, um, the political race that was going on. He didn't want to influence the election and he was a Republican and he was Trump's Republican and they knew about it and they suppressed it and they minimized it. They, you know, they discounted, they actually came out and lied about the legitimacy of it. And then they lied about the legitimacy of things that were on it and they still haven't covered it. And it affected the outcome of a presidential election. And so Trump tweeting this, you know, it's another one of Trump's dopey tweets. I'm not supporting his tweet. Trump's a dope, right? But, you know, and he walks right into these things. Like he said, he used the word terminate and he used the word constitution in a tweet. And of course that was going to play poorly for him. But him doing that was based in the fact that the outcome of the election was affected by censorship and out and out conspiracy to suppress social media that supported Trump and promote social media and mainstream media that supported Jojo Magoo. That actually happened. All of the narratives leaving, leading up, like it's the same thing when Trump's economy collapsed and the economy was not good, but it looked good at the time. You know, the, the overall economy was about to collapse again because of the debt-based economy. But the, you know, the... The economy at the time looked good. And Trump looked like a shoe in to win re-election. And then they rolled out COVID and they beat Trump with the COVID stick and they closed down the economy. And then they said, look, our economy is doing horribly. right?" <laughs> and they didn't give any context to the fact that they were the ones who pressured. Jojo Magoo was saying shut down the, the government, shut down the, you know, the economic system, lock everybody down, right? Jojo Magoo is for the lockdown. And then when the the COVID, you know, and then when the economy crumbled, cratered, Jojo Magoo was like, oh, he's got the worst economy in any presidential, you know, but you're leaving out the context. And that's what they've been doing for a while. The Republicans have done it too, and Fox does it, and Trump does it, but they don't have the power. They don't have the power of having social media and the mainstream media and the money and the corporate money and Hollywood all in lockstep to support these faulty narratives. And so when you see through it as either as a, a right wing person or as a truther, it pisses you off. Like Trump saying terminate the Constitution, which he really didn't say that. They're still they're taking it a little bit out of context, was the fact that he has a legitimate complaint, a complaint that had the Hunter Biden story been covered like it should have, it would have affected the election, right? There's no way that I mean they have covered Jojo Magoo with 
uh, completely. I mean, the guy's senile, and he's been senile for a while. He obviously has multiple issues. He's a liar and a groper and a snoozler, all these things. And they gave him this, you know, this spectacular coverage where they wouldn't address any of the issues. And that's, you know, that's effed up. And so, of course, Trump is and his supporters are desperate, you know, because, you know, of what, the way it was. They're just ignoring reality, right? There's a p- big piece to the story. You know, if you're going to talk about Trump tweeting, you have to address the, the legitimacy of his complaint that the Hunter Biden story suppression affected the outcome of the election. In fact, Trump would have won in a walk away had the Hunter Biden story broke and been covered the way it was supposed to be covered, right? Because it's, a, you know, an epic story. So we heard reaction from more Republican lawmakers yesterday. All of them defended the Constitution, but only a handful were willing to speak forcefully against Trump. But they did. The bottom line is, you guys are pretending this Hunter Biden story is nothing, and it isn't, right? I mean, it's, you know, it's so much more than that. So I was going to cover some stuff with Ye, but I don't have enough time. This thing went on longer than I thought. And I want to get to this epic comment here. Okay, so I was making this video, I was looking through the comments, um, and there was an epic one, and it says this, you have a lot of good content. This is a person I've never heard before, so this is a first-time comment from them. You have a lot of good content, but the tone is so depressing. (laughs) People going through their, their awakening on these difficult truths come here and make it even more depressing. Sprinkle in some positivity. (laughs) Um, Just an awesome comment from a person who leaves a negative comment about my content. That's their one contribution. Someone who's never commented before, at least as far as I know. And it's they're talking about being more positive, but their comment is negative and they're complaining, right? You're a negative person. And that's why... You look at what I'm doing here as being negative, which I don't look at at all like that, right? Because the truth is never negative. The truth is never, you know, in the sense you can spin it, like you can look at something, you can look at anything and and be grateful for it. You could, you know, miseries as divine blessings as part of the Saj Mark, you know, heartfulness, one of the maxims. And it's, you know, it's something I think about all the time. But the difference between me and you is I don't get bummed out or depressed by any of this stuff, right? In fact, it makes me think about enjoying what's here for us. I was talking about this with my wife today. That, you know, I, it's something I constantly say that you should enjoy what you have here while you still have it, right? And your reality, my reality, all of our realities is that this system that we're 100% dependent on is built on deception and imaginary wealth. And our lifestyle and everything that we enjoy, everything that supports our needs and desires and whatever it is, is predicated on a debt-based currency that has no real value. In any moment, it can collapse. But even if that wasn't the case, your life can collapse in any number of ways. We're all going to die. Like, that's inevitable. People say that the only two things that are inevitable are death and taxes, but it's really just death because, you know, you could live in a society without taxes and people have in the past, but death is something that awaits us all. And we all think that we're not going to die. We don't think about death. And that's why people complain and waste their lives and they worry and they wring their hands like this guy is doing and thinking about what I'm saying here as depressing instead of thinking about you should enjoy what you have now and prepare for what's going to happen in the future or whatever you do. You can, you can use the information any way you want, right? But you shouldn't take anything for granted. Everything that you have can be taken from you and your life can be taken from you, your loved ones, your, I mean, think about this Hollywood celebrities dropping like flies videos and people literally dropping like flies, having cardiac arrest, young people, the moment they're vibrant, you know, enjoying life, and then boom, their heart stops. I mean, this is where, what we live with. I mean, since I've had COVID, you know, I get better. 
and my energy level comes back, and I'm able to crank out a lot of work. I've been talking about, you know, I just finished up using the bulldozer, and that was epic. Just I miss it like it's some great thing I want to talk about in future, you know, something, in some other video. Um, you know, but we rented a bulldozer, and that was great. And I was sick going into it. And, like, I didn't know. Like, we were supposed to get it a week earlier. We had to back it out and all these things because we had COVID. And I didn't know how fast I was going to recover from this third bout with COVID. But since I've had COVID, when I do have energy and, you know, I don't have some, like, a regular heartbeat or whatever it is, right, you know, which is most of the time, like, you know, it'll go on for six months. I don't have any signs of like any sort of post COVID reaction and I'm, I'm healthier and stronger, but I still am more appreciative because of, you know, my strength was gone. There was times I couldn't do the work when we, you know, for about two years, you know, year and a half, I was up and down and, you know, my, I just never, my strength wasn't there. And, you know, then I had, I had good periods and then would go away and come back, whatever it is. And it makes you appreciate life. When you get a terminal diagnosis, you can sit there and whine and talk about how negative it is and get depressed, or you can enjoy and live out the rest of your life and, you know, stop being a worrier because you know you're going to die, right? Most people worry because they're not dealing with the, the fact that you're going to die, right? That this is a temporary situation and, you know, most people don't live. They don't live their lives, right? And so what I tell you here is, you know, you might consider it a negative truth, but, you know, you can take it any way you want, right? But this person who wants what? He's, you sprinkle in some positivity, which means lie to you, right? It's lying to you. You know, I don't consider any of the stuff that I talk about here negative. I mean, sometimes, you know, whatever it is, it could be insulting and mocking and whatever. You know, I don't think those things are positive, but, you know, they're funny, you know. <laughs> but in terms of the content, we all have to realize that the system that we're 100% dependent on is extremely fragile and is demonic and... It's eventually going to, it's going to cease to exist and we don't have a plan B. Most of us don't have the skills and the community and the, you know, whatever it is to go back to the old ways. I mean, that's the reality. When our ancestors were lured off the farm and they hemorrhaged their tribal skills, their agrarian skills, their homesteading skills, their villages, and they moved to the big city and they depended on a debt-based economy that was guaranteed to collapse, right? And this big lie that was told, I mean, this is the real big lie, that the system would always be there for you, and it's not. And so, you know, you should enjoy what you have to enjoy. You know, Babaji, the second master of the Sajmark systems, the heartfulness system, you know, he used to have these very simple meals he'd feed people. But he'd say, you know, eat up and enjoy because no one's guaranteeing you're going to get a meal like this tomorrow, Right. I mean, he was talking about, you know, future times, that you think that this is guaranteed, but, you know, all the wealth that, that people think they have, the stock market, you know, your currency, I mean, derivatives markets, the value in your, your house, your everything, with a snap of a finger, it can all be worthless. Worthless paper, worthless digital money, it can all disappear. People think they have a lot of money. They have money in the retirement, stock market, all these institutions, banks. The banks can take your money or it could just be devalued. You think you got a million dollars, but it could cost a million dollars for a loaf of bread, right? And so, yeah, I, I'm retiring with a million dollars. Okay, but it costs $100,000 for, you know, a, a bunch of bananas, right? <laughs> like, you know, inflation can destroy your wealth as well. And so nothing here is permanent. Like, we don't we don't live in a state where... Anything's guaranteed. It happens in nature all the time. You know, some... I was watching this video where there's these owls, barn owls, beautiful animals. It was really cool looking. And they had, a, you know, a, um, a home inside a, a tree log, like, a you know, one of those knots where there's, a, you know, there's some area and it's warm and dry. And these kestrels came and bullied them out of the... You know, they harassed them until they went and they, they found another home, right? But that happens all the time, right? You know, a bigger animal moves into your territory and you have to pack up and leave or there's a storm or there's a forest fire and, you know, you have to survive that and you have to migrate to somewhere else. And, I mean, nothing's guaranteed. Like, you you know, you might be the, the, the king of the jungle today, but, uh, 
you know, a bunch of new younger lions are coming around the corner to steal your pride, you know, your, your, <laughs> your, you know, your family. And so, I mean, none of these things are guaranteed. That's what we live with, right? And that's something that most people, you know, can't handle. They, you know, you want security that doesn't exist. You want safety that the government could never provide for you. And, you know, you might as well enjoy what you have today because it might be gone tomorrow, right? But the information itself isn't negative. It's your perception of it. It's, you know, it's what you think about it. But spiritually, there's great opportunities, which I talk about too, when there's a collapse. Because right now, we are, you know, the system is preventing us from or influencing us away from the divinity that resides within all of us, right? Um, But, you know, I mean, it's only negative if you think about that way. The truth is never negative. If I'm telling the truth, if I'm seeing at least a clearer version of the truth where then you're getting somewhere else. You, know, you have all the fear-based truthers out there and you get all the you know, the mainstream delusional people and all the rest of it. But if this is clearer than that, then there's, you know, vital information that you're getting and you can use that information to prepare yourself or at least to, you know, be grateful and, and be appreciative of what you have today because it could be gone tomorrow. Anyways, only spirituality will save this world. It's Paul Romano, definitely pouring from the Apocalypse and the Ascension. Everyone have a blessed day and be grateful.